So this video is going to be about tonicity and osmosis. So first we'll look at the effects of osmosis on water balance. So let's say we have this U-shaped tube right here, and on this side we'll call it compartment A and then compartment B. So on compartment A we have three sugar molecules, and in compartment B we have five, and those two compartments are separated by a semi-permeable membrane, which is permeable to the water molecules but not to the sugar molecules. So when we have a situation like this, with our water levels initially um, equal to one another, what's going to happen is that water is going to move towards the compartment that has a higher concentration of solute and therefore relatively a lower concentration of water molecules. And so water in this case is going to move from compartment A to compartment B. So when I say the lower concentration of water molecules, that um, can be a little bit confusing to think about, but because we have a higher concentration of solute in this tube right here, that means uh, if we have more solute, then relatively we are going to have lower water molecule uh, concentration because that extra space is now being taken up by the uh, solute. So if we allow these two sides to come to equilibrium, what it's going to end up looking like is the side with the five sugar molecules is going to have a higher water level than the side with three sugar molecules. And again, this is going to be because we have water moving towards a region of higher solute concentration. And so it's important to note that when we're at equilibrium right here, that doesn't mean that water has stopped moving. This just means that we have no net movement of water. So water is still going to be moving back and forth across this membrane, but it's going to be moving in either directions at equal rates, so we're not going to see any more change in the water level. So now that we understand how water moves uh, when we have solutes present in it, and um, we can look at tonicity and look at some of these uh, comparative terms. So if we have this beaker with a red blood cell in it, so um, the solute concentration inside of a red blood cell is 0.9%. So if we put it in a solution that is, let's say, 2% um, sodium chloride, then what's going to happen is water is going to move from inside the red blood cell out into the solution, and the red blood cell will shrivel. So because it's moving out, we'll say that this solution is hypertonic. It's a hypertonic solution, and when this blood cell is in a hypertonic solution, it's going to shrivel. And so there's also two ways you can look at these situations. So the um, outside solution is hypertonic to the inside of the red blood cell, but the inside of the red blood cell is hypotonic to the solution on the outside. So it's important to remember that hypertonic and hypotonic and uh, isotonic, so all of these terms are comparative terms. So um, in order to be able to really use them, we need to have two um, different compartments that we can compare to one another. Otherwise, these terms don't really have much value. So now that we've seen an example of hypertonic, we know water is going to go out and this cell uh, will shrivel. So let's look at a different example. So let's say um, we still have 0.9% sodium chloride on the inside of our red blood cell, but now let's say we have 0.5% um, sodium chloride in this solution. So now the solution is hypotonic to the inside of the red blood cell. So what's going to happen is water is going to again move to the region of higher solute concentration. So it will go into the red blood cell and the red blood cell will eventually burst. And so again, just like there was a different way to look at this one, there's also a different uh, perspective for this scenario where the inside of the red blood cell is now hypertonic to the solution. So I'll go ahead and write the um, other way to look at it underneath these. Just so we don't uh, forget that there's always two ways to look at these situations. And either way would be correct to say that the inside of the red blood cell is hypertonic in this case, or to say the solution's hypotonic. Both of those are correct. So lastly, we'll look at a situation in which the inside of the red blood cell, which is 0.9%, and the solution are the same. So in this case, this situation is called isotonic. And so 
In this case, nothing is going to happen to the red blood cell. Water will be able to move in and move out at equal rates. So nothing is going to happen. The cell won't shrivel and the cell won't burst. Um, it's just going to stay the same size. So in this situation, um, there's really only one way to look at this because the solutions um, are both isotonic. So you could say um, you could still say the inside of the red blood cell is isotonic to the solution, or the solution is isotonic to the inside of the red blood cell. But there's not a, a different term that we can use in this scenario. So just to review really quick, um, if we have a um, blood cell placed in a hypertonic solution, water will leave the blood cell, go to the region of higher solute concentration, which is the solution in this case, and uh, shrivel. If we place the cell in a hypotonic solution, water still moves towards the higher solute concentration, which is inside the cell in this scenario, so the cell will swell and eventually burst. And lastly, if, it's, if the concentration of solute is the same on either side uh, of this membrane, of the blood cell's membrane, then we're not going to have any net change in the size of that red blood cell, although we still have uh, water moving in and out of the cell just at equal rates, so we don't see any of that visible change. I hope you found this video really helpful. The concepts and information presented in these videos will be true regardless of what biology course you're taking. However, the material we covered in this video is specifically referencing material covered in Campbell Biology's 11th edition. Remember that if you are an enrolled Baylor student, we do offer free tutoring on the first floor of the Sid Richardson building, and you can schedule a free 30-minute appointment to have one-on-one -on -one tutoring online, or you can stop by during any of our business hours. For more information about the services we provide, you can go to our website at www.baylor.edu tutoring. Thank you.